Welcome to Primetime News. It's Friday, April 25th here in Korea, live from Seoul. I'm Moon Gwon Young. And I'm Daniel Chan. Thank you for joining us. In waters off Korea's southwestern coast, at the site of the Seoul ferry accident, search operations are now well into its 10th day. Not a single survivor has been found since the ferry capsized last Wednesday morning. But there is no let up in search efforts, with authorities deciding to use a diving bell at this site for the first time earlier this Friday. This afternoon, for the latest, we now go live to our Song Ji Sun at Ping Mo Kang Harbor, the nearest point of land to the accident site. Ji Sun? Guys, it's past 10 p.m. Korea time. The search operations are ongoing here around the clock, despite the strong wind and the currents getting stronger by the minute. Five more female bodies of Tanwon High School students have been recovered this Friday, raising the death toll to 185 and reducing the number missing to 117. Divers focused their search on the fourth level of the ship where the cabins of most Tanwon High School students were located. A diving bell, a chamber that can be used as a base and transportation of divers underwater, has arrived at the accident site and is on standby to be deployed. This will help to increase the number of divers engaged in search operations and would enable them to stay under the water for up to an hour without interruption. We'll have more details on that status in our later newscast. Despite the deployment of full manpower and equipment, it is becoming tougher to recover bodies compared to previous days, one, because of the current getting stronger again, and two, because of the obstacles within the ferry like broken furniture and the cargo, Besides the fact that the divers now have to expand their search in areas on the left side of the ferry, which is now touching the bottom of the sea. As for lifting the ferry, five cranes are on standby. The search operation will go on as parents of the missing have requested that the ferry not be lifted out of water until every body is recovered. Now, Jisana, my understanding is that search efforts were revved up following demands by those parents who are still anxiously, anxiously waiting at the port there. This all-out effort is following requests of angry and desperate parents who showed distrust and claimed the government to serve a rev of their efforts to find the bodies of their children. They have sat down with the maritime minister and the chief commissioner of the Coast Guard Thursday overnight for seven hours, making their requests heard. More civilian dives were brought back into operation as the parents have requested. Also, after a handful of bodies were misidentified, some transported back and forth to Jindu and Ansan, authorities have expedited DNA matching tests, and parents are notified of the result within 24 hours since the bodies were recovered and brought back on shore. The government is also providing military helicopters for tra transferring the bodies at the family's request. Several parents also got to bars to witness search operations at the accident site this Friday. This has been Song Ji-san reporting live from Tengwokang Harbor in Sindo. Two big questions knowing at the back of everyone's minds who and what. Authorities are broadening their investigation into what happened on the day the Sewalho ferry capsized and who is responsible for this man-made disaster. For more details, we are now joined live in the studio by our UDN. Lianal, how is this investigation coming along? Good evening, guys. An advisory panel of 13 experts has been set up to find out the exact cause of the accident, and they held their very first meeting this afternoon. The panel includes professors, maritime specialists, and experts from the shipping industry, and they will attempt to reconstruct the accident using a mock-up of the ferry. The simulation will take into consideration the current, the weight of the cargo, the speed of the ferry, and its condition at the time of the accident. Now, Leon, uh, the team of investigators or the team right here are now looking into a sister ferry of the Soho to look into a possible clues for why it sank. That's right. Prosecutors are looking into the Ohamanaho Ferry, which is also owned by the operator of the Seoro Ferry. The Ohamanaho is almost identical to the Seoro in size and follows the same route. Now, it has a history of seeing its engine fail twice in route in the past few years. But more than the cause of the accident, we are learning that the Seoro Ferry could have been utterly unprepared for any sort of disaster by looking at the Ohamanaho. After raiding the Ohamanaho, prosecutors today uncovered some disturbing facts during a crackdown of the vessel. Investigators found out that 40 of the life rafts did not work. They were just jammed in place, and the investigators had to kick it several times to make them 
uh, drop into the sea. The emergency slides installed also did not operate properly. Now there was also there was no equipment to tie down cars, and although there was equipment for tying down containers. It malfunctioned. It's not a stretch to say, according to investigators, that the story would have been much the same for the Seoul ferry. It is a huge, huge machine, and so many things could go wrong, and most of them did go wrong. Now, what about the uh, captain and the crew members of Seoul Ferry? Most of them are facing criminal charges, right? That's right. Eleven of the crewmen have already been charged with uh, negligent homicide while violating maritime law, uh, with the remaining four under investigation as suspects. And it seems likely that all 15 rescued crewmen will be charged uh, with criminal charges within the next few days. Now, the investigation is also looking into the ferry's operator as well. Its management is facing accusations that it lobbied its way out of mandatory safety checkups for its vessels. Amid the crackdown, we are learning that the practical owner of the Seoul ferry operator, Yu Byung On, stands accused of embezzlement that he and his family own at least three paper companies. Investigators say these companies were used to facilitate deals among the ferry operator's affiliates, possibly for the use of providing kickbacks and other irregularities. The operator of the Seoul ferry, the Tonghejin Marine Company, and its affiliates were also found to own 15 overseas branches where they have reportedly had over nine million U.S. dollars stashed. Now that nine million dollars were marked as losses in his account book. Well, uh, Leon, I'm sure we will find out more on the investigation results in the days and weeks to come, and I'm sure all eyes will be focused on the results. Thank you, Leon, for that. Now, the higher the death toll gets, the fewer number of families there are there are at an auditorium in Jindo. For the past 10 days, hundreds of devastated families of those missing in the ferry disaster have been camping out in this auditorium nearby the accident site. All right, Connie Lee has been there covering their story for the past few days, and she joins us live. Connie, tell us what the atmosphere is like there now. Hey, Daniel and Kan Young. Well, earlier on this Friday evening, there was a briefing held by officials from the Coast Guard, Navy, and private rescue divers, where all those directly involved in the search and recovery process. Now, the briefing was held in their words to clarify some misunderstandings. Now, referring to a blueprint of the sunken ferry, each official explained to the anxious family members here at the Chindo Auditorium that they are doing their best to retrieve all those still unaccounted accounted for. Most divers are apparently only getting about two to three hours of sleep each night as they work around the clock. Officials explained in detail which areas of the ship they have entered and which areas of the ship they have yet to explore. After some arguments from unsatisfied family members, though, the briefing ended in applause, with family members thanking the divers for their work. Now, this sort of clarification from search, res uh, search and rescue officials comes a day after family members here exploded in anger. Around this time, late last night, the family members stormed out of the gym and onto a bus to Pingmukong Harbor to confront search officials there. Now, as you heard from our Chizan reporter earlier, there was a bit of a protest between family members and search officials. Now, family members were angry that search operations were slow and accused officials of not being transparent about their search procedures. Reporting live from the Chindo Auditorium, this has been Connie Lee. The group memorial altar in Ansan was busy all night long and is filled up again on this Friday with visitors from all walks of life lining up to lay flowers in front of the portraits of the young people who so tragically lost their lives in this terrible disaster. For more, we connect live with our Kim Ji-yeon, who is standing by outside the memorial hall. Ji-yeon. Hey, guys. 
It's dark out here as the night progresses, but there are still a lot of people heading into the memorial. More than 63,000 people pay their respects here in Ansan so far, and I've talked to some of them earlier today. I hope they are resting in a warm place. My nephew is still in the ferry. I sincerely hope they rescue him soon. Because a lot of people have come here, I think they are going to cross over to the other side with a smile on their face. Now, Jian, uh, I'm sure there are many more of us who would like to go and pay a visit to those who perished in this tragic accident. Now, when can they go? Well, for those of you who are planning to come here to Ansan, you can come here anytime. It's open 24 hours a day and will be open throughout the weekend. Another group, Memorial Altar, is in the southwestern city of Mokpo, closer to the accident site. And the memorial is not just limited to Korea. Overseas in Australia, a memorial altar will be set up starting Monday until May 2nd at the Western Croydon Park from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. local time. Also, for those who are too far away and can't make it to any of these sites but want to say your last goodbyes, you can visit an online altar for the deceased high school students and teachers. More than 107,000 people have already sent their condolences there. I'm Kim Jeon reporting live from the Ansan Olympic Memorial Hall. Now, more than a week has passed since the Seoul Ferry capsized, and still many students who have survived the disaster continue to face trouble suffering from insomnia and emotional instability. Well, reportedly, students are hoping to get back to class, much like their schoolmates who returned to Tanwan High School yesterday. But it seems like first they will have to need some time to send off their fellow classmates and, of course, say their last goodbyes. Our Connie Kim has more. It hasn't been easy for the student survivors hospitalized at Korea University Ansan Hospital as they are still recovering from the aftershock of the tragic Seoul Ferry accident. However, most of the students are hoping to go back to their classes after hearing news that Tanon High School reopened for class Thursday. This according to the director of Korea University Ansan Hospital during a press briefing Friday. This is where all but one of the 75 Tanon High School students are recovering. Unfortunately, students are not expected to be released anytime soon as the hospital stated that most of them are still suffering from insomnia and anxiety. The hospital plans to release all the students at the same time to further support their mental stability. Earlier this week, the hospital has said that one out of four students are not sleeping well and that about 20 percent of them needed psychological therapy. Fast recovery for the students seems to be the utmost priority right now as the Gyeonggi Provincial Office of Education has requested the media to refrain from interviewing the students. Also, the Korean University Ansan Hospital had originally restricted hospitalized students from going to the memorial altar to express their condolences, citing that it would slow down the recovery process. However, the hospital is considering whether to arrange a date when they can all go together to say their last goodbyes. A total of 74 Tanon High School students currently hospitalized are expected to visit the memorial altar at Ansan Olympic Memorial Hall after they are released. Connie Kim, Aibang News, Ansan. In general news, the leaders of Korea and the United States held talks in Seoul on this Friday. From North Korea's nuclear threats to territorial and historical differences among other countries in the region, Presidents Park Geun-hye and Barack Obama spent well over an hour discussing key issues. Choi yoo reports. Before sitting down for talks, the leaders of Korea and the U.S. remember the victims of last week's Korean ferry sinking that left some 300 dead or still missing. As a father of two teenage daughters himself, President Barack Obama expressed deep sorrow for those who lost their lives. In response to North Korea's latest threat of a fourth nuclear test, President Park and Obama said they, along with the international community, will not accept further provocation by Pyongyang and that there will be dire consequences. Our two 
시급성을 갖고 북한 비핵화를 진전시켜 나가기로 하였습니다. 우리는 양국 간 긴밀한 공조를 바탕으로 오자를 포함한 국제사회의 일치된 대응과 협력을 이끌어내기 위해 계속 노력해 나가기로 하였습니다. In a display of their shared determination to stop North Korea's provocations, Presidents Park and Obama will visit their country's Combined Forces Command Headquarters in Seoul on Saturday. It will be the first time the leaders of South Korea and the United States visit the venue together. In consideration of the security threats posed by Pyongyang, the two leaders agreed to review delaying Washington's wartime operational control transfer to Seoul in 2015. On territorial and historical claims in the Asia-Pacific, the U.S. president said his country does not have a stake in specific claims at the center of dispute. This after he affirmed Washington's support behind Tokyo over its island dispute with Beijing. On Japan's wartime sexual enslavement of women in the region, President Obama said there must be accurate and clear accounts of what happened, but that involved parties must also look into the future. I also think that it is in the interests of both Japan and the Korean people uh, to look forward as well as backwards and to find ways in which the heartache and the pain of the past can be resolved. Reflecting strong Seoul-Washington ties, the U.S. leader also returned Korea's nine royal seals that were lost during the Korean War. Choi Yusan, Arirang News. And with speculation building about a possible fourth nuclear test by Pyongyang, a pro-North Korean newspaper in Japan has condemned the South for even mentioning the possibility. Well, ironically, though, that could be a sign that another nuclear test is actually in the works. Our Kim Hyun-bin explains. The Choson Shinbo, pro-North Korea newspaper based in Japan, accused South Korea on Thursday of spreading false rumors about the possibility of a fourth North Korean nuclear test. The editorial claims so was raising speculation about a test to divert attention away from the Seoul Hall ferry tragedy, calling it a major insult to the North. Such comments are nothing new and could indicate that Pyongyang is actually gearing up for another test. Four days before Pyongyang's third nuclear test last year, the North Korean regime condemned Seoul and Washington in a similar fashion, just as they did in 2009, before a second one. It is possible that North Korea is playing psychological games with the South. We are keeping a close eye on the North as they could conduct another nuclear test. Some North Korean experts believe it's unlikely that Pyongyang will conduct a fourth nuclear test in the coming days or weeks, as recent events don't follow the complete patterns seen in the past. The regime typically launches intercontinental ballistic missiles or rockets prior to nuclear tests, which hasn't happened. But the Korean government says it's prepared for the possibility, with a number of significant events taking place in the coming days, including U.S. President Barack Obama's presence in the region and the anniversary of the establishment of the North Korean People's Army. Kim Hyun-bin, Adidas News. The first quarter numbers for Hyundai Motors are in, and it was a mixed bag of sorts. However, analysts say the outlook for Korea's largest automaker could be brighter in the second quarter, especially with new models being released soon. Our Kwon so has the details. Korea's top automaker Hyundai Motors' first quarter earnings showed mixed results, but the outlook for the second quarter is generally positive. The company's operating profit rose 3.7 percent in the January to March period, compared to the same period last year to around 1.8 billion U.S. dollars, with sales rising 1.9 percent to roughly 20 billion dollars. However, net profit dropped 2.9 percent on year. Analysts say the first quarter earnings fell short of expectations because of a number of factors, including the strong local currency and the rise in sales expenses due to a reduction in old models. But experts say there is no need to worry. Although earnings aren't expected to pick up that much in the short term, a new line of models set for release should provide a boost. Hyundai forecasts that its new Genesis luxury sedan and the seventh generation Sonata will help boost sales in the coming months. Analysts say Hyundai should then start shifting more vehicles in the second quarter. 
They also forecast exports to rise by nearly 7 percent, which could push production at Hyundai past the 5 million car mark this year for the first time ever. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. And Korean consumer sentiment remains strong this month as the economy continues its moderate pace of recovery. The Bank of Korea says the nation's consumer sentiment index came in at 108 for April, unchanged from the previous month. The index is an indicator of consumers' outlook on the economy, living conditions and future spending, with a reading above 100 meaning optimists outnumber pessimists. The central bank said the figure could dip next month because of the ferry disaster. It's time now to get a check on stories making headlines on the global front with the deepening uh, crisis in Ukraine to rising concerns of cyber attacks in the U.S. Let's go live to our Polly at the News Center. Hey, Paul. First, let's start with Ukraine. The United States and Russia, they've been locked in a war of words over the crisis in Ukraine. And it appears Washington has launched the latest volley of allegations. That's right, Daniel. The U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry has said in no uncertain terms that Moscow is behind the escalating conflict in Ukraine. In a press briefing on Thursday, Kerry accused Russia of stoking the very instability that it says it wants to extinguish. Kerry said instead of, of holding its end of a deal reached in Geneva last week, Russia has taken steps to distract, deceive and destabilize the region by funding and coordinating the separatist movement. He added the U.S. was drawing close to imposing more sanctions on Russia unless it backs down immediately. Meanwhile, deadly clashes erupted on the ground in eastern Ukraine, with as many as five pro-Russian rebels reportedly killed by government forces. In response, Moscow has launched new military drills along their shared border. And turning now to the Middle East, Israel has suspended U.S. moderated peace talks one day after Palestine's Mahmoud Abbas government agreed to reunite with its rival, Hamas. An official statement by Israel said it will not hold negotiations with the government, backed by a, quote, terror organization that calls for Israel's destruction. Israel, the U.S. and the EU regard Hamas as a terrorist group, in part for its near daily attacks it has aimed at Israel from the Gaza Strip. This past Monday, a surprise unity pact was reached between the dominant Fatah faction and the Islamist Hamas group, the first move of its kind in years. And moving on to the United States, where top government officials are growing increasingly concerned of cyber attacks targeting the airline industry. According to magazine Foreign Policy, American security and intelligence agencies are working with airline manufacturers to help defend against hackers that could disrupt computer systems on modern planes. The government had planned to roll out what it called a next-gen air traffic control system over the next decade to make air travel more efficient and less expensive. However, potential security flaws were discovered in the system due to its reliance on GPS technology. That wraps up our look at international stories making headlines around the world. I'll see you back here next week. With the speed of tidal currents picking up, all efforts must be put into rescue operations while they're still manageable. For more details on the weather conditions, our Kim Bogyang joins us here in the studio. Bogyang, what's the latest? Well, guys, some unwelcome news that strong winds and rain is forecast uh, for tomorrow. At the moment, visibility has opened up to about 15 kilometers, while wind is blowing at about 1.9 meters per second. And waves, waves, that is, remain fairly gentle at 0.4 meters. Tidal currents speeds will drop later tonight at 11.10 p.m. There will be three more slowdowns tomorrow at 5.44 a.m., 12.05 p.m., and 6 21 p.m. However, tidal currents should speed up to over 2 meters per second over the weekend. Weather will no longer be favorable as strong winds are forecast to blow at a maximum rate of 14 meters per second with waves at 2.5 meters. Elsewhere in the nation, dry weather advisories continue to be in effect, so please be on the watch out for forest fires. Otherwise, some regions may get showers on Sunday. That's all for now, and I'll be back with the latest after midnight. 
Thank you, Bogyoung, for that. And those are the stories we're following at this hour. I'm Moon Gonyoung in Seoul. And I'm Daniel Chen. Thank you for watching. Stay tuned for the latest on the ongoing sunken ferry rescue operations or find us online at arirang.co.kr for more. We'll see you next time.